what am I not in? You're in all the things. Yes. Something comfortable. Mm. Oh. Hey, 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 and guess what? <laughs> we have we have a brand new opening bit. Those little pre-roll things from people. It's oh, a yes. limerick. Ooh, exciting. Yeah. That is exciting. It's pretty exciting. You want to hear it? Yeah, well, please. We hear, no, let's surprise us when you hear the show. Well, I'm well I think to, he's that starts the show. That was so. the point. <laughs> that was the point. <laughs> I kind of can't not play it when I start the show because it's the first thing. Um, I thought you were going to preview it for us. That's what you meant. Uh, no, actually, I'm just going to play it. <laughs> so here we go. Tom was a man I didn't personally know. But every day, I listen to his tech news show. If you have a dollar to spare, to keep Mr. Merritt on air, to Patreon forward slash Ace to Tech, you should go. This is the Daily Tech Limerick. I'm Tom Merritt. And uh, joining me here on this lovely Friday, June 5th, 2015, is Mr. Darren Kitchen of Hack5.org. Uh, and if you happen to be watching the unofficial video version of this, you'll notice that he is coming to us from the Threatwire set. Yes, it's so good to be here. It's so exciting. Such an amazing time to be alive and to be on the Threatwire set because it seems like, you know, the only thing ever th the only thing coming out of the news is our material these days, you know? <laughs> it kind of is. like I didn't try today to make it full of Hack 5 stuff. Sure I didn't have to. I, I knew you to. made today the 2-year anniversary of Snowden becoming a whistleblower for I did. me. I did. For me. Uh, for you. Also, uh, hat tip to Shannon Morse for figuring out how to get couponing legitimately into Threatwire on Wednesday, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, so, so you and I were both doing that. Like, what? Yes, I was like, was, wait a minute, Shannon. And I was like, no, no, that's a legit no, story. You can, legit. That, that, yeah. A lot of money. <laughs> totally. No, that was, that was very deft. Uh, you know, just... Speaking of legit, I hear that Len Peralta is joining us. Yes. Mr. Len Peralta is here to illustrate the show. Len, um, we won't talk about sports. I promised for this. Well, that's 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 all right. I'm 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 not a fragile man, but uh, yeah, let's not talk about it. Although I do want to say, there was once was a young man named Merritt, who I don't know. I, I couldn't. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna pull, like pull out a, a fresh limerick there. I wish I could. Had so much hair, you could pull it. <laughs> okay. You could wear it. Yes. Okay. Maybe we should just do the headlines then. Yes. Okay. Let's please do. It. Okay. Please do it. <laughs> Uh, the Skype for Web beta is now available in the United States and the United Kingdom. New and existing users of Skype can sign in and connect to Skype without the Skype app by installing a plugin. Uh, it works in Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari, or Firefox. Uh, all you got to do is go to Skype.com or web.skype.com if you want to be, like, really precise. Skype will continue rolling out Skype for Web worldwide over the next few weeks. Skype, Skype, Skype. Lots of Skype. <laughs> Skype is in your web. Oh, my gosh. No, yeah. Skype is such a conflict. You know, I thought Skype was so cool when it was originally done by the, uh, oh, what was it, the Morpheus guys? But now Skype's Microsoft, and Skype operates in a really weird way, where it's like sometimes a telecom provider, like in the United States, where it shares its data with the FBI, while at the same time it refuses to share its stuff with foreign nations, because, you know, it's not a telecom. Um, and it's weird, because I know in my heart that if I were to, like, App, knock on the door of the NSA and say, hey, what video chat app do you think I should use? They'd probably say Skype, which is exactly why I'm not a fan. And there are so many good alternatives uh, that do a better job of protecting your privacy. Uh, for example, the open source Jitsi, which we just recently featured on Hack5, supports uh, STRP encryption, things of that nature. So I, I feel like, one, this is a little too late, and two, plugins, really? And three, come on. Yeah, the plugin thing undercuts what I was going to pull out as a positive from this because I never use Skype for anything I expect to be private. I use it mostly for recording podcasts and things that I'm going to be putting out anyway. However, I do love this trend of swinging back to the web, right? Uh, you know, setting aside what you may or may not think about Skype and Microsoft. I love this trend. I want to see more companies saying, oh, you know what? We decided actually that there already is a platform that is cross-platform compatible. Yeah. And then, of course, we get to the plugin, as you said, and it's like, oh, well, then that's not exactly what I was hoping for. But it, yeah, no, at, at the point that you need a proprietary plugin, it might as well be a proprietary yeah, app. Yeah, I know. So, really, well, it's just getting that it's cool the right impulse, it gets though. The badge. It gets to have that web badge without actually conforming to any of the cool things that are, I don't know, like HTML5 but standards. But even that, even that makes me hopeful. Like, wow, they even want to pretend like they work cross platform on the web. Like, it must be cool enough to do that again, finally. 
I don't know. Yeah, well, if it was really cool, it would be at WebRTC, but that's just how I feel. Come on, Skype. WebRTC up in this place. USA Today reports that Google will begin to report incidents involving its driverless cars on a dedicated website with the human driver details redacted for privacy. In addition to reporting accidents, Google.com slash self-driving car will give examples of how the cars adapt to everyday traffic situations and take some community feedback if you've got the thoughts about it. After about six years of testing and 1.8 million miles driven, the Google fleet says it has been involved in 13 accidents, according to reports the company submitted to the Department of Motor Vehicles. And project leader Chris Umson noted that all of the accidents were the fault of other drivers. So if you're like, wait a minute, they're going to hide the drivers of these driverless cars. What does that mean? It means the people that cause the accidents, which are the other cars on the road. Right. Now, I love this. You know what I find really interesting about this is just how more and more transparency has really become the norm with these tech companies. So I really have to champion that. Bloomberg reports that Apple is still negotiating with record labels over the revenue split from a music streaming service it's developing, allegedly. Apple is expected to announce the service at its Worldwide Developers Conference this coming Monday. Music labels currently get about 55% of Spotify's monthly $9.99 rate. Music publishers take about 15% of that. So the labels are supposedly asking Apple for 60% because they want a better deal than they cut with Spotify. Give the musicians the mu the money directly. Yeah, or or you know just work with snubs and see if you can get some coupons for that. <laughs> She's in the chat room now, by the way. CNET reports that California-based Microdia is showing off the Extra Elite 512 gigabyte micro SD card at Computex in Taipei. That's right, 512 gigabytes on a micro SD card. Micro SD cards can actually go up to a, a terabyte or more, but nobody's done it as far as we know until now, and, or nobody's done it that much and this is the biggest one anybody's seen in a while uh the micro sdxc card will use version 4.0 of the sdxc standard which means ultra high speed two bus speeds up to 300 megabytes per second this is a gargantuan yet tiny flash storage device and it's going to cost you a big price a thousand dollars when it goes on sale in july ouch just, but just imagine though you could like accidentally inhale half a terabyte that's good yeah, stuff. it's just under two dollars per gigabyte. It's a bit <laughs> steep. It'll come down. I, I just anyway, <laughs> this story will continue until the end of time, and I'll always have the same thing to say, which is we need a Beowulf cluster of these. Yeah, you always do, right? And and granted, yeah. it'll be a thousand dollars at first, and then it will come down. I mean, the fact that there are gigabyte uh, micro SD cards now, they used to be ridiculous prices and, and now they're not. So yeah, to me, it's always impressive to be like, wow, okay, we figured out how to commercialize 512 gigabytes. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. The sad thing is most people are going to use XFAT as the file system on those. And that's just, that makes me cry. Yeah, I get, I mean, they say that the one group of people they expect to actually purchase these at $1,000 would be professional photographers or do pro photographers use XFAT? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, a lot of these cards, that's just what they do. I know my Sony camera uh, does that by default. No choice. VentureBeat reports that Google partnered with Adobe to make Flash more power efficient in Chrome. The Chrome beta now automatically pauses Flash content that it doesn't deem central to the web page. Uh, mostly those sidebar advertisements, while keeping central content playing without interruption. That's that YouTube video of cats that got embedded in the blog you're reading. If Chrome beta pauses something you want to see, you can resume playback, of course, just by clicking on it. Google expects the feature to make its way into a stable release as early as September, although you can go turn it on in the advanced content settings uh, under privacy in Chrome right now. You know, when you first said this, I actually thought that what you meant was not central, like, to the content of the, say, it's an article on a news website. Uh, from what I understand, it just means that you would have to, you know, say there's some flash content down on the page. It's not going to really load until you scroll down there, similar to the way that some websites save a lot of bandwidth by not loading every image until you kind of scroll down to them. But now I kind of just wish that it would work the other way around, where it's just like, oh, don't even play the flash content until you look at it. Like if it could do anyway. eye tracking? Yeah, bring I'd it. Just be, yeah, I'm into that. Earlier this week, PayPal updated its user agreement with a clause that specifically allows the company to send robocalls and promotional text messages to users, even if the users never gave them their phone number. It's just as long as PayPal guesses it, apparently. Uh, as you might imagine, it did not go over very well with people. Today, TechCrunch reports that customers can 
opt out of receiving auto dialed or pre recorded calls, most likely because angry customer and ag- advocacy groups drafted a letter to the FCC which uh, takes a very dim view of robocalls of any kind. It's not clear yet just how PayPal will allow you to opt out of these robocalls yet. I don't know. I just think they should pick up war dialing. Yeah, there's, I've already seen a few people saying, I'm not using PayPal anymore. A lot of times people say that and then they realize, well, the alternatives out there are not as good or everybody wants to pay me through PayPal, so maybe I'll go back. Uh, but I think, I think PayPal is definitely feeling the pressure here. I think most of that uh, always comes back to, and also Europe. And everybody in Europe nods their head in agreement. (laughs) And Gadget reports researchers from the Sensor Systems Lab at the University of Washington in Seattle say they're able to charge a Jawbone Up24 fitness tracker with Wi-Fi. The researchers inserted just enough noise into the signal to keep power levels steady without disrupting the data transmission. They didn't even see any speed drop-offs. Power over Wi-Fi, as they're calling it, can charge the jawbone to 41% in two and a half hours. No, no, don't do it. Stop Why it. Why not? Why? Stop. Just what's wrong? I, with I don't. Okay, I don't believe for a second that uh, that you can do it without impacting other Wi-Fi. Sure, you can like listen for the clear descends and and all of those like control signals, but you're going like bandwidth is bandwidth. Like you're going to take they a just part of all that. they did. You got to read the paper, dude. And I, and and I'm curious if you still have the objection because you might. But what, well, what they I'm did saying didn't is, they didn't impact the data or they didn't even put any signals in it. They just put noise. The noise keeps the microbursts that are naturally occurring that cause power generation going. And they found the level where Wi-Fi can over, all Wi-Fi always overcomes noise. Wi-Fi can overcome the noise they needed to sustain power generation without impacting any of the data transmission because the, the, it's just noise. They're not actually putting anything in the data stream. Right. No, I, I understand that. What I'm saying is I've, I've actually done this by sending okay. say, beacon frames or something else where there's like a finite amount of uh, nanoseconds of these chirps that you can actually use on that spectrum. Um, and if you use them all up, there's not a re- enough for the rest of it. So what I understand is, yes, if, say, there was an existing network with, say, five users and this much transfer was happening, you could do what you're saying in a way that doesn't impact that. But the second a sixth person wants to come in, you have to oh, so be you think very. It has a capacity impact. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, I, I okay. don't get me wrong. I love the concept, but maybe on a different frequency. Well, you know, they I'd got love router... to see something from the FCC well, on this. Well, honestly, uh, why not? Why not build a router yeah. that has you know? I mean, we've got routers with du- dual frequency already. Why not build a router that can send you know can. Maybe we just deprecate 2.5 gigahertz and say that's for power generation and 5 gigahertz for everything else, right? Well, I mean, it's funny that you should mention that the 2.4 gigahertz is from the industrial scientific and medical where it was typically, you know, what we knew of it before Wi-Fi was that thing that your microwave leaked out. So I'm, anyway, I get a little hesitant about this kind of stuff. I would love to see the technology grow, but maybe give it its own sandbox. Uh, Well, and that's why this is not rolled out. Right. Yeah. This is them saying, hey, we figured out we were able to do it at all is what the is what the big advance here is. And then all of these questions that you're bringing up are the things that they will have to solve if they want to actually turn this into something that could work. But if they do, man, do I want this? Well, like I if think they that, answer all I your think... questions sufficiently. I want my devices to be able to charge themselves. I want sensors that don't even have to have a battery in them. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that uh, the Wi-Fi term is being applied to this because it's what consumers understand as like that magic wireless. So uh, maybe it just needs something else. Mm, all right. Let's, I feel like uh, a grandpa here saying, get off my Wi-Fi, but you know. No, you, you explained every, all your resistance, <laughs> no pun intended, uh-huh. uh, to this uh, was explained when you said you've, worked, you've tried this, right? As soon as you get close to a topic like this, you're like, wait a minute, I know I'm, all the flaws. Well, what I'm saying is I have saturated a channel with enough uh, data that nothing else can use that channel. And so don't do that. I don't know that that's exactly what they're doing. But anyway, I'm, I know you know more about this than I do. So I'm, I'm curious if you read this or if you read their paper, mm-hmm. uh, what that, you come back That will to. be my homework. All right. Cool. Uh, DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com is the place for you to submit a story or vote on the other stories and let us know what to talk about in the show. It's not 
like determinative. We don't look to just that. We look to all kinds of sources, uh, including our own expertise. But man, is it helpful to see what you folks are interested in. For today, the top story was Abatuela Condolce submitting the Engadget article on an attack on the U.S. Office of Personnel Management database containing four million records of current and former U.S. federal employees. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management, or OPM, is in charge of conducting background checks on federal employees. So that's some sensitive data. The U.S. FBI is in charge of the investigation. OPM will issue notifications between June 8th and June 19th to their employees offering credit monitoring and identity theft protection. The New York Times cites some researchers who believe the attack may have been conducted by the same people who attacked insurance companies Anthem and Primera's systems because, Darren, as I know you guys have reported before, uh, credit card numbers not as valuable as they used to be. But, man, building a whole profile that can get you uh, some medical equipment or drugs or, or, or just, you know, be able to impersonate someone very thoroughly with mm -hmm. this kind of information, that brings in some high dollars. Yes. Also, uh, we, this is one of the stories that we covered on ThreatWire today, which is out on hackfab.org slash YouTube now. Uh, and, but, Tom, I must say, you missed the headline. See, the story goes, China hacks the U.S. government with Chinese hackers from China while drinking out of China teacups. <laughs> do, do we know that? No, but that's the headline. And I actually have to applaud you for not mentioning China, China, China in this well, story. Because uh, every security researcher says we have no evidence that this is actually the result of China. Uh, the only thing is the U.S. said it appears that the attacks originated in China, which all attacks appear to have originated in either yes. China, the U.S., or Russia. If you're a self-respecting attacker, you make it look like it came from one of those countries. Right. So anyway, I'm actually just applauding you for not bringing yeah. that into the discussion. And by doing so, I have brought it into the discussion. <laughs> discussion. I appreciate the impulse, though. Uh, Star Fury Zeta chose the Ars Technica story that Administrator Charles Bolden said that NASA is looking into advanced propulsion technologies that could cut the eight-month journey to Mars in half. The technologies being studied range from solar electric propulsion to nuclear rockets. Uh, he just says, look, we, we need a little bit more money and we could save a lot of money because because the returns on this are great. If you cut the journey in half, you cut the amount of supplies you have to take to support people's journey to Mars, which then cuts the fuel and propulsion you need, which then cuts the amount of fuel you need because you don't have to carry the fuel you need to, you know, it just like keep, it, it builds on itself. So it, it's definitely worth the investment. And it's a good speech to listen to if you're in tune space stuff. Right. I mean, you know, if you've ever tried to go on a really long trip with a spouse or something that just you, you are inevitably going to pack too much. So stay nimble, pack yeah. light. SP Sheridan picked the Wired story about a computer that developed a scientific theory without human intervention, other than creating the program in the first place. Uh, scientists at Tufts University programmed a computer to develop theories when faced with a problem. And then biologists at Tufts University chose a 120-year-old problem of how sliced up flatworms are able to regenerate new organisms in the proper shape and proportion. They know how they're able to regenerate, but they're like, how do they make sure it regenerates as an actual flatworm and all the parts are right. Uh, the computer reverse engineered a solution on its own, uh, did it in about three days using like its own logic to figure out how to run simulations. And they have published that solution and the details about how they created the program in the journal PLOS Computational Biology. See, scientists, just when you thought your job wasn't safe from robots. <laughs> scientists then realized what they had done and immediately deleted the program right uh no this is this is fantastic though because at, at least at this stage in all seriousness this is the kind of of program that can make scientists job a lot easier mm. is to say like hey this is the thing we're looking at you know basically scientists could have done this on their own but they wouldn't have been able to go through the permutations in enough in in their lifetime they could have programmed the permutations for a computer to run that's not artificially intelligent, but that would have taken decades to make sure that like, okay, now that we've done this permutation, let's go to this one next. So they just cut out the middleman on that. It leaves scientists the ability to do more theorizing and, and applying and testing and reviewing. Yeah, I, I've seen what happens when you have the supercomputer do all of the permutations before with those big questions. And sometimes you just get 42. Yeah, other times you get the solution is not to play. There we go. And that's a look at the headlines. Hey, by the way, before we get into the main discussion, did you see Mr. Robot, the, the pilot? 
from USA network that they put up on YouTube for free? I know that it uses a Wi-Fi pineapple, yeah. uh, or at least that's what the director or, is who emailed me told me. Yeah, well, it looked like a pineapple, so I was good. That's one of the reasons. I was yeah, we actually just that. had to sign off on it. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, you got to watch it. Uh, okay, I know they don't get everything right, but man, they worked hard to try. Yeah, it's really interesting that this has actually changed. I mean, it kind of goes along with what we're talking about, but like, um, <laughs> it's changed our whole corp, or like our whole sorry, corporate, our, our whole culture, right? So yeah. like hacking is like, you know, used to be a dark art and now it's just like an everyday thing. Surveillance used to be something that we did against Russia and now it's like an everyday thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah our main discussion uh, today is the uh, fact that two years ago, Glenn Greenwald published NSA collecting phone records of millions of Verizon customers daily in The Guardian. It was the first of what we would later find out uh, were a trove of documents leaked by Edward Snowden that are still producing news stories two years later. Yesterday, Edward Snowden posted an op-ed piece in the New York Times, uh, sort of claiming some partial victory, uh, noting that U.S. courts have declared call tracking unlawful, which was the first story, uh, noting that Section 215 of the Patriot Act was not renewed, although the USA Freedom Act, which is also a surveillance act, although more restrictive than Section 215, has been passed. Uh, the UN, since these leaks, has declared mass surveillance an unambiguous violation of human rights. Brazil passed its own version of an Internet Bill of Rights. Encryption by default has become the norm. More vulnerabilities are being discovered and patched because people are paying more attention. On the other hand, we have more invasive laws being passed in Australia, Canada, and France that enact new surveillance powers. Uh, Darren, you've covered this space for a decade and you've been covering it very closely, obviously in the past couple of years. Do you think the leaks have had the effect, the good effect that Snowden claims in this op-ed piece? Yes, yes, to the point where uh, it has impacted just about every walk of life. I mean, uh, we were just joking around about some little TV show. Uh, and, and that's not to say that Hollywood wasn't glorifying hackers and that beforehand but uh, it has just become that more prevalent that it's made its way into our mainstream and I feel like even that uh, what was that terrible terrible movie um, it, it ties in with that the, the um, no no I'm actually thinking about the DPRK uh, one help me out here oh so uh, yes the Seth Rogen or, yeah. the Seth Rogen movie yes yeah, so to the point where like it's impacting Seth Rogen movies I feel like James Franco uh, it has made its way down to like mainstream, which is so great because it's uh, it has been successful in its awareness and it has been successful in changing the popularity of what would otherwise be something that lawmakers could go along with. And now it's just too unpopular to touch. Uh, it has changed the uh, perception of uh, technology and privacy to where privacy is actually a core focus first, where we see more and more transparency reports, uh, where things become encrypted by default and uh, it's, it's good. The discussion has spurred many amazing positive things. Uh, and and I yet think we have no new laws. Piece. We have new laws being passed in countries that increase surveillance. We still have the USA Freedom Act, which, while it's more restrictive than Section 215 of the Patriot Act, is still enabling surveillance of U.S. citizens in some cases. Uh, was it worth it for Edward Snowden to do this? Well, I mean, somebody had to, right? Because previous to that, it was you, you weren't given that kind of validation that it's a, a legit thing. It's always swept under the rug as tinfoil hat speak. And so, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very thankful for the sacrifice that Edward has made. So, uh, I, so <laughs> I know it's not gonna it's not gonna change everything for the good like immediately. We're still going to have bad laws. We're still gonna have bad politicians. It doesn't change that fact, but what it does is it acknowledges it and allows us to discuss it and make changes. And I feel like the, all of the changes that have happened would not have happened otherwise. Now, and and the other side of this is people out there that I've read today saying he hasn't changed anything. People are unaware of what's going on. Uh, and, and yeah, maybe temporarily we had a little uh, sleight of hand change in the law, but we all know how that works. Uh, give it a couple of years and they'll be back to their old tricks. Uh, what needs to happen in order to preserve the privacy of people for real and not let the sliding into the surveillance that happened before happen again? And how much privacy do we actually need? Like, I, I think, if I can jump past that first question that I just asked you, because I think there's, that's a, more, a simpler answer. Uh, 
wh where should the line be? Like now that we've realized like, okay, that maybe was way over the line. I think most people agree with that. Uh, there are people who say, but I want them to be able to watch the bad guys. My personal opinion has always been, yeah, well, getting rid of encryption for all of us doesn't stop bad actors from encrypting. Uh, surveilling all of our communications doesn't necessarily mean you're cap catching the, the, the bad actors' communications. And in fact, uh, the U.S. has done a study commissioned by the White House that found that most of the surveillance did not lead to any kind of prevention of any kind of act. So, you know, how, how do we decide how much privacy we need responsibly? Mm. Okay. Uh, that was a lot of questions, Tom. Let me first... Let me let, land on the last one there. Okay, let me challenge that first one that you said, which is that, uh, yes, a lot of people are unaware. I mean, if you've ever seen, um, for instance, I'm blanking on his name now. Uh, Don Oliver did a pretty good oh, piece. Oh, right, where uh, last week tonight, yeah. Right, he interviewed uh, Edward Snowden, and leading up to it, there was like this kind of streeter type interview in Times Square, asking people who Edward Snowden is, and a lot of people, you know, the, the quote-unquote average Americans, like, oh yeah, he's the WikiLeaks guy, or being completely, uh, you know, just mis and uninformed. And so yes, you're right. Uh, a lot of people are not aware, but what's important is that a lot of very important people are aware. For instance. You know, the, the, the concept that you can get an Android phone or if an iPhone that's encrypted by default uh, is because of those people who have become aware and are making positive changes. So while, you know, your mainstream may not be as, in, you know, uh, as uh, so enlightened about this Mainstream kind of awareness isn't the goal. Awareness by the right people is the goal, and that has happened. Right. Okay. Yes, and that has. Uh, on the other side, on the political side, you're absolutely right. We have seen, like, I feel like calling the the small victories that we've seen baby steps is kind of belittling baby steps. Like it's <laughs> it's minute. Like it's 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 micro millimeter steps, right? Uh, yeah. Nanometer steps, uh, to quote Tom Merritt. And the um, you know we see the focus on things like metadata uh, shifting the focus onto to something that's really just peripheral and esoteric and, and not actually the the core of it uh, to get you know the same kind of party line debate going on that actually doesn't make any sort of change uh, so yes that hasn't uh, there hasn't been enough good change on the politics side of things but there has been enough good change on the technology side of things and what you're what you were leading at was the whole concept that yes, people feel many different ways about what privacy is and how much we should have and uh, uh, where that line should be. But I feel like what it was before was you had very privacy focused uh, hackers, tinfoil hat people, things of that nature, right? And now it's just kind of like, especially with social media and, and this, this world that we live in now where it's like we've all <laughs> made those mistakes with um, with privacy settings and things of that nature, that we're more and more aware of privacy, um, and so I think what's changed is we actually get to have that discussion, whereas before it wasn't being had, or it was being had, but it was in a secret court, and we didn't weigh in on that. And so yes, that line needs to be defined, and that line is going to be different for everyone, but at least we're having that conversation, and that's really a beautiful thing. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I, I agree with you that we should be having that conversation. I also believe, and, and I, you, you may not agree with me, and that's fine, that our intelligence agencies do, should have the right to watch. Uh, to be able to see things that are in public. And so, so there, there's not a, a threat of them not having that power now. So I think it's a false debate to bring that up. But as a backstop, I'm like, I'm okay with them watching public. As long as I have the right to encrypt my things, as long as I have the right to be private, uh, because the bad guys, the bad girls are going to have the right, uh, are not going to care about the right. They're going to make uh, their stuff private. So of course, law enforcement should be able to to watch what is in front of them uh, because, you know, uh, as we saw recently uh, in Syria, uh, people screw up sometimes mm -hmm. and they make things public that they shouldn't have and you can take advantage of that. And that's where you get the victories. Uh, so I am also of the belief that we should allow people to encrypt everything that they want. 
Uh, and, and I also don't think that companies should be compelled in most cases uh, without clear warrants and public court supervision to hand over uh, bulk amounts of information without a clear reason why. But I understand, I've, I very much sympathize with intelligence agencies and law enforcement about the fact that they say, well, wait a minute, that's really crippling us. Uh, we, we do need to have more than that and we can act responsibly. And I would, like to, I would like to hear somebody in the audience who's from that side, especially anyone who's experienced. And I know if you're really experienced, you probably can't talk about it. But uh, to make the case of like, hey, give us this much and it really doesn't trample on your rights and helps us out a lot. That's that line that you're right. Having this conversation has allowed us to get to the point where we can talk about where that line should be. Right. No, uh, don't get me wrong. I've never, you know, I, I accept surveillance. I think it's beautiful that we have the technology to uh, protect ourselves, like encryption and things of that nature. Um, and I feel like it's very much a balance, especially as the m modern society that we live in, to be an active part of it, you're kind of like, you know, urged to use uh, social networks and things of that nature where your thoughts no longer are your are owned by you or protected by you and they're the, the interests of the organizations that may or may not have your, your best interests in mind and may be coerced by the government to give your thoughts to them. Uh, I think what you're, you're talking about is the, the concept that, well, yes, it is amazing that we have this technology that can uh, enable us to have privacy. And, and when I say us, I mean everyone across the board, good people, bad people, to decide how you pass judgment. But um, it, it's kind of like, okay, at one point, uh, nuclear weapons were developed, and we had this technology. But how do you use that technology in a, uh, in a, in a socially appropriate way, if there is such a thing? Right. You know what I'm saying? So th I'm, not, I'm not equating technology to, I'm not saying it's bad like nuclear weapons. What I'm saying is there's been times in the past where suddenly as a humanity, we have developed technology that is empowering. I mean, nuclear technology will get us to Mars, right? And uh, Possibly, destructive yeah. and uh, just scary and amazing. And so this is kind of like that. Um, but I'm of the opinion, encrypt all the things. Yeah. And, and don't let them water it down. And don't let them break the, uh, the technologies and uh, keep us back, right? I'm, I'm more of the opinion of the United Nations that's like, give everybody the strongest arms possible in this. Yeah. Anyone who wants to break into your encryption doesn't have your interests at heart for whatever reason, they say. Right. Uh, and for that reason, I asked Darren uh, to make our pick of the day uh, and give us some encryption picks, things that are, that are good for you to use to encrypt all of your things. Yes. Uh, so for if you're a Linux fan like myself, you'll probably want to go with Lux, L-U-K-S. Uh, it's built into most modern distributions, and that will do full disk crypto, which especially if you cross borders, you want to use, although you will probably be compelled to give up your password if you go into the United Kingdom and probably go you to could jail. Be. You don't. You probably so won't be, but you, you could be. You yeah. probably won't be, but just be yeah. aware of that. Um, on the Windows side for full disk encryption, uh, the um, Discryptor is a really good, it's been vetted by the EFF, uh, it's open source, uh, that's another good one. Personally, for volume encryption, I like InkFS, E-N-C-F-S, it lets you do just small volumes, similar to like TrueCrypt, and uh, you can use those in conjunction with sharing services like Dropbox, uh, and that's also Windows and Linux. Um, and I'm not much of a Mac guy, so I don't really have anything on that end. So I'll, I'll throw in fi File Vault built into Mac. Uh, in my experience, uh, works great. I have not seen anyone uh, say that it has any significant flaws. Not that anything is flawless, trust me. Uh, but but File Vault seems to be the the best way to go with OS X. Yes, and as far as messaging, I should probably also put out there that Text Secure is really the way to go. And um, and EFF.org slash secure dash messaging dash scorecard. We'll put a link in the show notes. They have, uh, EFF does an amazing job actually breaking down, uh, you know, not just if it's encrypted, but if it's encrypted in transit and if you can verify a context identity and all of the other things that you're going to want to know about messaging. Uh, and the, there are a lot of uh, amazing technologies and actually it's not, a lot of which are like far and beyond just the, the you know, PG, PGP. Uh, so uh, tech secure is my kind of go-to for uh, secure text messaging. And that's uh, one that gets all the checkboxes. And I'll go ahead and link that in chat. 
Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Just one message of the day, and it is a voicemail from Joshua, I think fittingly in the theme of this show. He's got a little bit of a tinfoil hat thing going on about Google Photos. He says he hasn't heard anybody else say this, but I know I have heard other people say this. You're not alone, Joshua. Hi, Tom and the gang. Just sort of starting to get to the Google I.O. stuff, and uh, everyone's been raving about the Google Photos. And I've been sort of thinking about it. Can you imagine all of the data that Google is able to get, much more personalized information than ever before, by looking at the photos that you take? So, for example, you take photos, you tag, okay, this is my child, right? My child is three years old. Or this is my Apple Mac that's sitting there in the background. This is a Coke can sitting here on the table, right? They all of a sudden will be able to analyze these photos that you're taking and determine the kinds of brands that you're into and begin very specifically targeting advertising uh, to you and selling that advertising information potentially to other advertising agencies which concerns me. I don't know what Google's policy is on selling user data and how randomized that is, but in in a day and age where privacy is a bit of a concern for me, uh, I, I find this to be a little bit troubling with how good image recognition is getting when we're talking about uh, targeted advertising. Um, anyway, just a perspective I, I haven't heard anyone else talk about. Anyway, love the show. Bye. You are not alone, Joshua. Although, actually, that, that's very implied because there are so many crickets around you. <laughs> it was actually soothing. Uh, yeah, it really was. You know what? I must say, so then the next step is, right, I catalog the audio signatures, and now we know that you live in an area with crickets, so we can start sending you advertisements for oh, iguanas. Oh, no, you're going to freak about. I'd love to eat those. I, I do think that uh, it, that might be helpful for him, right? I don't think advertising being more targeted is my fear on -hmm. something like this, right? I actually want that. I want, if I have to ever see advertising, I want it to be something that I'd be at least interested in knowing about. That's what advertising is supposed to do. What I do fear is everything else he said, which is image recognition, you know, creating more uh, information about you and then selling it to other people like that. All of the rest of that and used for even more nefarious purposes is what disturbs me. Yeah, well, this technology has to evolve if we're ever going to have robots that can actually make sense of their environment. So by using a massive data set that is Google's uh, uh, image library of everybody's photos, uh, that gives them that data set to to really increase that, kind of similar to how uh, we used in Google Voice the, the translation thing, and that actually made... Google service is better where I can actually use Google now and talk to it and say, give me directions to the nearest taco joint and it works. Yeah. So it's a trade off. It's going to be you're giving to data see, to not anybody. just this, but where it leads. Yeah. Twitter.com slash hack five Darren, H A K five D A R R E N. And of course, hack org for threat wire and hack five and Metasploit minute and more H A K five dot O R G. What do you guys got going on over there these days? Oh my gosh, so much good stuff. We just uh, did a, a threat wire talking about China getting blamed for, uh, for all the hacking. Yep. Big, big hacking stuff. Uh, I don't even remember. I just shot it on this beautiful set here. Uh, but go ahead and check out ThreatWire. It's done by Shannon Morris and Patrick Norton and myself. Uh, we're rounding up the security, privacy, and internet freedom news three times a week. It's lots of fun. You can find all of those at hack5.org, H-A-K, the number five, and on YouTube. And we're, we're coming up on 200K, so we're very excited. Oh, and we're going to be turning 10 years old in uh, August at DEF CON. So if you're going to DEF CON, come and see us. Bring... We'll have like birthday hats. Bring gifts appropriate for a 10 year old. (laughs) Yes, that will be us. Uh, Len Peralta, you have been commemorating the two year anniversary of the first Snowden leak. Uh, What do you got for us here? Well, you know, every once in a while, uh, you know, this is all fun and games. I like to draw funny cartoons and stuff like that. Every once in a while, I like to do something that's a little more serious-minded. And uh, being the two-year anniversary of uh, Snowden and the leaks, um, I felt this was pretty appropriate. This is actually a a 
I looked up the original article. Uh, this is actually a, a, a quote from him saying, I am not afraid because this is the choice I've made. And uh, I watched the um, uh, the documentary about him, and even watching the documentary, it's like, why would someone like this, someone like that, do this? And uh, and as I was watching it, I was realizing, you know, thank God for Edward Snowden, and uh, bringing this into the forefront and let us talk about it a little bit, and uh, just letting people understand that this is uh, this is the world we live in. So I think uh, this is a kind of an editorial take on the Snowden leaks. So. Yeah, it's our it's our our first editorial cartoon. Uh, from Len Peralta on the show, and it's a good one, folks. Uh, I can't do it justice explaining it to you. You got to go to lenperaltastore.com and just at least take a look at it. Uh, yes, it, this is very well done. Uh, Thank you. Len, I, I love it. And so check, check out. Cool. Got it. <laughs> I was like, why is Darren being so quiet? Because he's buying that poster right now. <laughs> That's, that's yeah, going you, up on the you wall. can get it at lenperaltstore.com. Also, once again, you know, if you have if you have a couple of pennies lying around, uh, go to my Patreon and give me a little bit. Uh, you know, back to DTNS level, lover level, you'll get each one of these images as digital images. This would be a great iPhone or phone cover on your on your uh, on your computer, just as a reminder to watch your security. Yeah. Keep keep an eye on it. Uh, it's, it's it's really symbolic with the words coming out of his mouth and the zeros and the ones representing the bits. Uh, you got to take a look yes. at limperaltastore.com. Uh, thank you thank to you. our patrons. 5,056. It's going back up again. Thank you, guys. You guys are the best. Uh, you keep us going. We appreciate that enough of you see value in the show to keep it going for everybody else who gets to benefit from it. So thank you so much. If you want to support the show in any way, uh, dailytechnewsshow.com slash support has all the ways you can do it. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live at tunein.alphageekradio.com. Visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. And come back Monday for WWDC wrap-ups with Veronica Belmont and Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>